Welcome students to the lecture for week three, Educational Psychology. This lecture will help you understand the role that educational psychology plays in good teaching. It will help you understand how to become a more intentional and therefore a better teacher. Let's begin by asking ourselves this question. What makes a good teacher? Especially in middle or high school, what makes a good teacher is the knowledge of your subject along with a vast knowledge of pedagogy. Knowledge of subject is important. Think about math, for example. You wouldn't make a good math teacher if you didn't understand math. But pedagogy is equally important. Pedagogy helps you teach the material that you know to students. So what is pedagogy? Broadly speaking, pedagogy can be defined as the art or science of teaching, education, and instructional methods. We might know our subject area really well, but lack the ability to get that knowledge across to students. A whole field of study surrounds pedagogy. That is, a field of study dedicated to the practices and the strategies of teaching. If you understand your subject area well and you understand pedagogy well, you're more likely to become a good teacher. Now, you might be asking yourself, can good teaching be taught? Are you born a good teacher or are you made into a good teacher? And if it can be taught, how could it be taught? And what do I need to do to become a good teacher? Well, thankfully, the answer is a resounding yes. Good teaching can be taught and it can be learned. It's up to you to get better, though. How do you go about becoming a good teacher? Well, first of all, you have to be reflective. You have to be thoughtful about what is happening in your classroom. You go in with a knowledge about the subject and about yourself. So, for example, in this course, you've written a teacher narrative describing what attracted you to teaching. And you've thought a little bit about your attributes. What might make you a good teacher? What kinds of attributes might you have or challenges that you might have to overcome to become a good teacher? Every day, Teachers make hundreds of decisions in the classroom, so you have to learn a little bit about decision making. What makes for good decisions and poor decisions in the classroom? And you also have to learn about educational research. And that's where this course comes in. You have to know what educational psychologists and researchers have studied and learned for decades and more about students and about learning, about motivation, because we know a lot. And so it benefits you to understand how these things work in the classroom. Now, most outstanding teachers demonstrate what's called intentionality, which means they do things for a reason, on purpose. Think about that word intentionality. It has the word intentional inside it. You do things for a reason. You don't just do things willy-nilly. And to do things for a purpose, you have to be reflective. You have to think about things that go wrong and go right in your classroom. Because obviously, you want to maximize the things that go right, and you want to minimize the things that go wrong. All teachers, even good teachers, have things that go wrong in their classroom. But the difference between good teachers and poor teachers is that good teachers learn to spot when something went wrong and they learn ways to improve upon it. Intentional teachers constantly think about the outcomes they want for their students. And they're purposeful in making decisions that, that lead to those or impact those outcomes. They know that maximum learning does not just happen by chance. 
When you're an intentional teacher, you're constantly asking yourself questions like, what goals and objectives are you teaching? Is the lesson appropriate to students' background, knowledge, skills, and needs? Is each activity or assignment related to a goal? And is each instructional minute used well? Or is there wasted time in the classroom? If you're an intentional teacher, you'll also come to develop a sense of teacher efficacy. In other words, you'll come to believe that you, as a teacher, can make a difference in students' learning. There's been a lot of research into this area. And what's been found is that teachers who believe that they can make a difference in students' learning or have an impact on their lives are much more likely to, well, have an impact on students' learning on lives. If you don't believe that, you're less likely to have an impact. So teacher efficacy has been shown to be an important predictor of a teacher's impact on students. Think back to some of your teachers. Probably the most impactful teachers have been the ones that have been right in there with you talking about what you need to do to be successful, saying that they believe in you, saying that you can do this. Teacher efficacy has to do with the belief that you can make a difference in students' lives, in the outcomes for students. If you believe that children are just intelligent or not, they come from a home environment that you can work with or not, there are factors outside of your control that you can't influence, if you believe those things, you're less likely to have an influence over students. You're less likely to become impactful over your students' lives. One of the things that we know, however, is that teacher efficacy can grow over time. So you might start out thinking, I can't have much of an impact. But if you work on it, if you become reflective, and if you become intentional in your teaching, your teacher efficacy will also grow and improve over time. Good teachers focus on student outcomes. They're always thinking about what is it I'm trying to do with my students, not only in this lesson or unit, but in the long term. They're teaching their students 21st century skills or skills they'll need in the workforce, like creativity, critical thinking, becoming problem solvers. They're think teaching them how to evaluate information, how to deal with different forms of media and technology skills, and they're focusing on life and career skills. They're focusing on common core state standards, teaching them again to be flexible and creative in their problem solving using technology, being able to participate in active discussions, they teach them the ability to focus in terms of writing, speaking, and argumentation in groups. They, they focus on standards having to do with college and career readiness. They focus on reading and classic texts, as well as new and multicultural texts. And they focus math on problem solving in real world contexts, mathematical reasoning, precision, and argumentation. Expert teachers usually are also critical thinkers themselves. They're always asking themselves why or how. They like to learn. One of the best things you can do is to teach your students that you're a critical thinker and a learner. Critical thinking will also help you to become a better teacher because you're thinking about your own teaching. This brings us to the main topic of the lecture, which is, what is educational psychology? Broadly speaking, educational psychology is the study of learners, learning, and teaching. Educational psychology is designed to make better teachers through the study of learners, learning, and teaching. Learners are the students. Learning is how the students learn, and teaching is how we teach. What's the goal of research in educational psychology? 
It's to test ideas about learning in an objective and fair way. And from these tests, from this research, come a develop, we've developed a body of best practices that teachers may implement to increase student learning and improve student affect. It's extremely valuable to you to, to understand these best practices. They inform the hundreds of decisions you must make every day in the classroom about students learning their attitudes, their abilities, their strengths, their weaknesses, their behavior, and more. We want to learn these best practices that are supported by research because we will make good decisions, we will increase student learning, and we will increase student motivation. When you understand the research and you apply a little of your own common sense, you'll learn how to be an effective teacher. Now I'd like to talk about the golden rule of this course. The golden rule of educational psychology is that you start with questions, you apply theory, and out of that theory come the classroom strategies that we use to address the questions or the learning situations we have in class. Let's see what we mean. Suppose we're teaching a class and we have a, a question. If, if I reward a behavior, is it more likely to occur? This has to do with classroom management. You want to reward good behavior and not reward or punish poor behavior. Researchers have studied this question and they have a theory that addresses it. It's called operant conditioning and it's, it was developed by a theorist by the name of B.F. Skinner. Out of that theory flows a classroom strategy that can be used to improve behavior. Out of that theory, we have reward tokens, stickers, pizza parties, etc., that we use to reward good behavior in the classroom in the hopes that that good behavior will increase. Researchers have studied many, many such questions as that, and there are many theories that are aligned, and out of those theories flow classroom strategies that we use. Let's take a look at some questions that researchers have studied and that we could study. What are some things we could study about learners? Well, we could study whether boys or girls learn differently. We could study do students have different learning styles. We could study do students with different abilities, should they be taught separately or together. We could study the impact of home life on educational potential. Researchers have developed hundreds, if not thousands, of these questions that they study. And sometimes, out of the studying of these questions, they come up with theories. And through those theories, they come up with classroom strategies that consist of best practices for us to use. Similarly, what are some things we could study about learning? Some examples might include, what does brain research say about how we learn? Do metacognitive strategies improve learning? What types of curriculum work best to teach mathematics? Educational psychologists have studied these questions. Out of these questions and many, many more have, flowed, have developed theories. And out of those theories, we develop best practice strategies that we can use in the classroom. What are some things we could study about teaching? Here are some examples. How important is it for teachers to be passionate and engaged in their subject area? How important is it for teachers to be knowledgeable? What are teachers' impacts on students' academic achievement? How does reflective teaching benefit students? And many more questions about teaching. Again, Educational psychologists have researched these and many, many more questions. And out of these questions have developed theories. And out of those theories, we've developed best practices, classroom strategies that we'll be learning in, these, in this course. So to summarize, it's important to understand that good teachers are intentional about their teaching. 
they're thoughtful and reflective, and they make changes to their classroom and their teaching as they go along based on their experiences. It's also important to remember that teaching can improve through intentional teaching. You can become a better teacher. You can become a more efficacious teacher. It's important to remember that educational psychology has developed a set of theories about how students learn best and what motivates them. We'll be learning some of these theories in this classroom. And out of these theories flow the classroom strategies that we use. I hope this lecture has helped you understand educational psychology and why it's important to study educational psychology. The next week, we'll move off of this basic topic and on to some more advanced learning. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>